Thank you. Hello, good evening everybody. Uh, my name is Caroline Brown. A few years ago I came across a book called The Georgian Menagerie. Uh, it told the story of exotic animals in the 18th century and it inspired me to write a fictionalised account of those times for myself. At this time ships were coming, out, coming into the docks of London every day and they're bringing strange cargo from around the world the strangest animals that people had ever seen. But this was before London Zoo had opened. Uh, that was 1828. So what happened to animals before then? What did Londoners think of them and how were they kept? The story I want to share with you tonight is the story about animals before London Zoo existed. Though it remains controversial today, uh, we think of London Zoo as a place where animals are kept as well as might be expected and in as close to their natural habitat as possible. People have always been interested in getting up close to animals, but where were they kept before the zoo? Well, one such place was the Tower Menagerie in the Tower of London. From the 13th century until 1835, the tower housed a cl collection of wild animals such as lions and tigers, as well as kangaroos, lynxes, wolves, zebras, alligators, the occasional elephant, and even a polar bear. These creatures have mainly been given as gifts from powerful rulers across the world in exchange, in, in, in exchange as symbols of power and domination over the animal kingdom. The polar bear was a gift from the King of Norway to Henry III in 1252, and he became with the very strict instructions that he'd be allowed to swim and fish in the Thames as long as he was attached to a very long cord. This picture is a sculpture made of galvanised wire of the various animals that uh, were once kept in the Tower of London and they were installed about 10 years ago. The lions were particularly popular amongst Londoners. They had a choice of paying threepence as an entrance fee or they could bring a little dog or a cat as a small snack for the lions and that would be their price of admission. Around 1700, a new story began to spread around town that on the first day of April, you could attend the washing of the Royal Lions. Entrepreneurs even had tickets printed and sold. It was an April Fool's joke, of course, but one that kept going for many, many years afterwards, at least 100 years, and it's probably it's known as one of the oldest April Fool's jokes in London and it caught out many of those that were new to the city and it was one that I was managed to incorporate in my novel. People could also get up close to exotic creatures by attending one of the travelling, many, many travelling menageries which first appeared in England around 1700. These travelling animal collections were run by showmen, uh, the precursors of the latter-day P.G. Barnum and other future circus owners. The shows ranged in size, but the largest was probably George Woonwell's. Here's an example of how he would go about drumming up business and uh, promises no less than two elephants and five royal tigers. The story I want to share with you tonight and the setting for my book is in the place called the Exeter Exchange. This is on the Strand and it's where the Strand Palace Hotel is located today. There was an animal, uh, animal emporium located on this site for about 50 years from the 1770s until 1826. And many of the animal salesmen who got tired of the road and taking the animals up and down the country, they wanted some place to display their wares, either permanently or over winter, and they took up premises such as these. And at, at one time, I believe, there were three different animal emporiums all next door to each other in the Exeter Exchange. Uh, the map here you can see where uh, the Savoy is today and just across the road, it's all knocked down now, when they went to uh, widen the, the, the strand, the, 
the, the road that was drowned. They knocked down the Exeter Exchange, but uh, you can see very clearly where it is. And I've been into the, into the Strand Palace Hotel looking for a little plaque of some sort to say if, it, you know, if there was anything about the menagerie, but there's no mention of it at all, which I think is a bit sad, really. All sorts of animals could be found in these halls. There were three apartments and it cost a shilling to enter one of them and two shillings to enter all three. Extra, of course, was charged for watching the animals feed, which is not much different really from uh, Chessington Zoo or London Zoo now. When Pitchcock died, his employee, Polito, took over. This is a hand mill uh, from Polito, promising Egyptian cannibal, cannibal, Egyptian camels, Bengal royal tigers and an elephant, as well as two pairs of kangaroos, pelicans, a silver-headed eagle, an emu and also an ostrich. These handbills were given out in Covent Garden and the streets surrounding the area. You may be surprised that right at the very bottom you can see a great white polar bear. Sorry, that's the next slide. There you go. Right, great white polar bear right at the very bottom. It beggars the imagination to think, you know, how they'll keep a polar bear in such circumstances as that. Here's another image of the exchange. Uh, you can see the owner, Edward Cross, there in the middle, and uh, at the bottom, the various different animals that uh, you could see within the exchange. And the exchange, again, about 30 years later, you can see the wild beasts, are free and every day you could see them underneath just above a billiard sign. Edward Cross dealer in foreign birds and beasts. Lord Byron was uh, one of the visitors to the Royal Exchange and this is how he describes his visit on the 14th of November 1813. He doesn't bat an eyelid about the poor, the poor antelopes, but of course the, uh, the camel made him pine for Asia Minor. This is a very sanitised view of how the animals were kept. The marketing blurb says that all were in fine health and condition and so perfectly clean and secured that the most timorous and delicate may approach them without fear of being annoyed. Of course, uh, conditions inside the menagerie were nothing of the sort and were quite simply awful, inhumane and cruel. They were cramped, unheated, smelly, dirty and very badly lit indeed. The poor creatures had little room to turn around and we'd be poked and prodded by the visitors who would enjoy fishing in appropriate objects through the bars to see if the animals would take them. The keepers would put on a sadistic show, poking the animals and thrashing the cages with sticks to get them going or even taking their food away. Needless to say, there were numerous mishaps which the Georgians lapped up with relish. Take a look at this and uh, take a look closer at uh, this animal. You can see he, uh, the way he views the people who kept him, not a happy bunny at all. And who can blame him? The menagerie was shut on a Sunday and the animals would go without food and be crazed with hunger by the time the place opened up on Monday morning. I mentioned ostriches and emus earlier. They were very popular attractions at the time because people believed they could actually metabolise iron and uh, they were very, very keen to prove that this was the case. After one poor fellow died, it was dissected and its stump was found to contain buttons, nails, keys, a brass door handle, a candle snuffer, a sailor's knife, an iron comb, various small stones and marbles, and the grand total of three shillings and four pence halfpenny in coins. Some menageries would display the animals in what they called happy marriages. These were dissimilar carriages, uh, uh, dissimilar creatures which shared a den, a snake and a parrot, for example, or a dog and a tiger, a lion and a tigress. And I'm really fascinated by this subject because in later years, 
They would have traveling, uh, traveling people would take around um, little, little displays of animals in the, same, in the same cages, such as a cat and a rat and a few birds and a mouse or two, all in the same cage. And these would be called happy families. Um, the, the traders themselves would really pride themselves on the fact that they were able to uh, train these animals to all live in such a happy family. Uh, sadly to say, the trade only lasted about 30 years for obvious reasons. But the Exeter Exchange's most famous resident of all was, and the thing that actually led to the closing of the menageries, was an elephant called Tuni. I don't know if anyone's heard of Tuni. Tuni was an Indian elephant. It was brought to England in 1811 and originally exhibited at Covent Garden. His plays included Bluebeard at the Theatre Royal and Pantomime at the Drury Lane Theatre. But Tuni's behaviour was erratic and he was withdrawn after only 38 appearances. In 1812, Polito brought him to display at the Exeter Exchange. Tuni weighed nearly seven tons, was 11 feet tall and was valued at a thousand pounds. He was trained to do various tricks with his trunk to show off its dexterity and he could search for apples or coins in visitors' pockets and he liked to take a penny with his trunk out of someone's pocket and place it in a little box that was kept on the wall which later went to buy him treats. And it was said that he and his owner would sit down at the end of the day and they would share a pint of beer together or followed up always by a little tot of whiskey. Tuni was only a little elephant when he first arrived at the exchange and he was led up the fortified stairs to what was to be his cell for the rest of his life. And there he proceeded to grow and grow and grow until some 16 years later he had become a very big and very angry and confined elephant. The floor of his den had to be reinforced with bricks and wood but the truth was, there was no way they were ever going to get him downstairs again. People began to worry about him falling through the ceiling and stampeding down the strand or even attacking one of the visitors. They appointed a new keeper, a one-armed lion tamer, true, who was called John Taylor. And he realised that all Tuni needed was love and all went well for a few years until John Taylor left. Ill-treated again, Tuni became unmanageable and killed one of his keepers, for which he was fined the sum of one shilling. He was deprived of food, his tusks were cut off and he was covered in wounds. He was unable to even turn around or sit down in his cage. On the 27th of February 1826, Tuni had had enough and he began to tear his den apart. Men with pikes were called to try and force him back. Something had to be done. At first they tried to kill him with poison. They took four pounds of arsenic mixed with oats and sugar, but Tuni refused to eat it. They gave him sedative lace oranges, but he stomped on them with his feet. They filled burnt buns with mercury, and he ate them all except the one that was laced with mercury. He stamped on that one as well they prepared for the worst. By this point, Edward Cross was the owner of the menagerie and he summoned soldiers from nearby Somerset House to shoot Shuni with his, their muskets. The elephant was hit with 152 musket balls, but Shuni refused to die. The floor of his cage was deeply covered with blood and it is said that the sound of the elephant in agony was more alarming than the reports of the soldiers' guns. His trusted keeper was hidden in the wings and he commanded Tuni to kneel down. And when Tuni kneeled, John Taylor came forward and with his sword, he cut his throat. It took Tuni an hour to die. Cross kept the menagerie open that evening and he took 35 pounds at the door from ghoulish members of the public. 
flaring gas cylinders were set up to show their light into the corner of the room and just bright enough to see the vast amount of blood that was spilled on the floor. Hundreds of people paid the usual shilling entrance to see his carcass butchered and then dissected by doctors and medical students from the Royal College of Surgeons. The rotting five-ton carcass was flayed by a nine-strong team of butchers. The flesh was taken away in a fleet of carts and the story goes that many Londoners ate elephant pie that night, unknowingly. Rumour has it that the hide, which weighed 1,900 pounds, was bought by a tanner for the sum of 50 quid, but the intestines ended up in the Thames. Tunis skeleton went on display in the Hunter collection until 1941, when it had a director hit from the Luftwaffe airstrike. And the manner of Tunis' death caused uproar and was widely publicised. Illustrations were printed in popular news sheets of volley after volley being fired into his profusely bleeding body. Recipes were published for elephant stew, along with maudlin poems proclaiming, farewell, poor Tuni. Letters were printed in the Times, protesting at the barbarity of the process and the poor quality of the living conditions of the animals in those menageries. The controversy, the controversy was the inspiration for a successful, successful play at Sadler's Wells, entitled Tuni La, or The Death of the Elephant Ex Exeter Exchange, and it was the end of an era. The Zoological Society of London was founded a couple of months later, and in 1829, the Exeter Exchange was finally closed for good, and the animals moved to temporary lodgings on the site of the present National Gallery. The early London Zoological Gardens aimed to offer a far more respectable and genteel experience with animals. It was only open to subscribers and guests, and it was a very different experience from the rowdy and vulgar establishments of the animal merchants and emporiums on the Strand. In 1831, the animals of the Tower of London Menagerie were transferred to the London Zoo as well, and it was opened finally to the public in 1847. But that is another story indeed. Thank you.